afternoon, church. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm John Shidlow. Um, my wife, Christine, and I lead the youth group here, and I am a student, an online student at Liberty University, pursuing my Master's of Divinity. So that's who I am. That's why I'm here. And uh, Pastor Steve asked if I'd give the message today while he's away. So I'm going to go ahead and hopefully encourage you guys with some great information. This being... Um, Independence Day weekend, the day that we recognize where uh, our nation was born, the, the Declaration of Independence was signed, and we became a sovereign nation, kind of, apart from, uh, from Britain with the signing of that document. I thought it would be a great weekend for us to take a moment and look at where is our citizenship today? Is our citizenship here or is our citizenship really somewhere else, right? And I know that all of you know the answer to that question, but how much do we know about the place where we really are a citizen of? So today, we're gonna to take a deeper look at that and look at what does the Bible teach us about where our citizenship is and what is that place even like? Because I, I bet, I bet that if you're anything like me, before I study this, you have a lot of misconceptions about the place where you really are a citizen, where you are destined to go, your true home, your real home. <clears throat> so before we get into that, why don't we just ask the Lord to uh, bless this, this uh, message this morning and speak to our hearts. Uh, Heavenly Father, once again, it is a privilege for us to be here today in your presence. Lord, we thank you for this church, for the body that gathers here, for each and every individual, for every person, for all the work that goes on throughout the week, for those who are behind the scenes, who are doing things that nobody even knows they're doing, uh, yet they come and they faithfully serve you so that we could all come and enjoy this place and be sharpened like iron sharpening iron when we come. Thank you for Pastor Steve and Lorraine. Pray that they would enjoy their time off this weekend and uh, that you would watch over them and that they would be refreshed and rested with uh, whatever it is that they're doing. And once again, we just ask your blessing over this message. Help us to see you more clearly and to understand the future that you've prepared for us, that you uh, have in store for us. We love you, Lord. We want to see you more. We want to know you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so where is our citizenship and why does it matter? Today, I want to leave you guys with hopefully four, four main points. One, citizenship really is a very significant matter. And we should care deeply about our citizenship. <clears throat> Your connection with your citizenship will influence how you behave. What nation are you a citizen of? That will influence whether or not you go to war, who you're fighting for, where you're going to fight, these kinds of things. Our citizenship is ultimately, ultimately determined by God. Where we are a citizen of, the, where our true home is, is determined by God. And... Number four, I hope you will be encouraged to live as citizens of God's kingdom starting now, if you haven't already. So, before we get into that, I wanted to do a little quiz. Some of you here have citizenship in another country, but you've chosen to either live here or even seek to become a naturalized citizen of the USA. So, for those of us who are natural-born citizens... You should have all the answers to these questions with no problem. This should be really easy. I figured Jamie gave the dads a report card on Father's Day. I can give you guys a quiz on Independence Day weekend, right? Okay. So question number one. What are the three branches of the federal government? All right. The uh, executive, legislative, and the judicial. I'm channeling Pastor Steve with the clicker not working. Good. Number two, what are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution referred to as? Bill of Rights. That's right, the Bill of Rights. Very good. And what are the freedoms documented in the First Amendment? S speech, religion, assembly, press, and to petition the government. How many of you today feel like you really have the right to petition the government today? <laughs> How many of you really feel like you have the right to free speech? Yeah, right. Wake up, let's wake up, right? What year was the Constitution ratified? Very good, close, 1789. The Constitution was ratified in 1789. 
How old must you be to become the president of the United States? 35. Excellent. You guys are great, man. All right. What is the largest U.S. state by area? Good. Alaska. Anybody know number two? Texas. Man, you guys rock. Okay. How about this one? Let's see if I can stump you. What state is the most densely populated state, the most per capita per square mile? I was going to say, you guys should all know that. It's New Jersey. Anybody know number two? Rhode Island. You guys are awesome. Number three? Massachusetts. And just by way of comparison, I thought you would find this interesting. Number 10 is Pennsylvania. Look at the difference. Pennsylvania, which is only number 10 down on the list, is 286 people per square mile. New Jersey has 1,207. What a comparison, huh? Okay. Name any five of the last states to join the union and the decade that they joined. Yeah, right. Okay. Here you go. Here's the list. Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, Alaska, and Hawaii. And look at the decades. Did you guys realize that it was this late in history, in America's history, that these states joined the union? Good. I'm glad you realized that. What is the first line in the Declaration of Independence? How many of you thought that it was something different than this? Yeah, that's right. This is our Declaration of Independence. It's what we're celebrating today. We didn't even know the first line. So why, why did we go through this? Why did I put all of this up here? Well, I want to make the point that even though we're citizens of the United States right now, this is our home, this is where we live, we're here, right here and now, and there's a lot that we probably don't know about our, our nation. There's a whole bunch of, there are a whole bunch of questions that I could have put up here, and I'm sure that a number of us would have been stumped by a lot of them. And we live here right now. This is our home. How much more do you think we probably don't know about our future home, a place that we haven't even been or seen yet? Why? because we only read about it in the Bible. And let's be honest, how many of us really dig in and search the scriptures to see what, is the, what does the Bible really teach about heaven? Well, today we're going to look at that. We're going to find out about it. So why is it important for us to learn about heaven? This is, um, I think, a big question, and I'm going to give you another four points about why I think it's important for us to learn about heaven. Number one, so we don't have any misconceptions about heaven. In Romans 11.25, we read, I do not want you to be ignorant of the mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Now, Romans 11.25 is not talking about heaven, but I believe it's teaching us a principle. Paul, Paul is showing us that it's important not to be ignorant about theological truths. Heaven is a huge part of the reality of life for a Christian. And eliminating false ideas uh, and notions about its reality is extremely important. You'll see why when we look at more of the reasons for its importance. So number two, God commands us to learn about heaven. In Colossians 3, 1 and 2, we see, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. You, ladies and gentlemen, we can't focus on the realities of heaven if we don't know anything about heaven or if we're if we have false ideas about heaven, we won't be focusing on the right thing. So you can't focus on the things of heaven if you don't know what the things of heaven are, I think is, is the point. Number three, it will inspire and motivate us to live for God. Philippians 3, 14 says, I press onward toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. If we focus on the end of the race, we're going to be motivated to run the race strong and do all the things necessary to make sure that we finish it well. In 1 Corinthians uh, 9, 24 through 27, we read, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will, to, that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last 
forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So again, I think if we keep our eye focused on the finish line, we understand the race that we're running, and we're looking, as we're instructed to, we're looking heavenward, and we keep our eye focused, we're going to be inspired and motivated to live for God. We might make choices to sacrifice of our flesh that we wouldn't have otherwise made if we were distracted looking down at the things of earth. So we have to look up, and we'll be motivated. And number four, it will help alleviate our fear of death. Philippians 1, 21 through 26 says, for, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If, I'm going, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. So regarding this four, fourth point of importance, I want to tell you a little bit about a man named Vladimir Zelenko. Um, <clears throat> some of you might not recognize his name. Here's what Wikipedia has to say about Dr. Zelenko. Vladimir Zelenko, Zev Zelenko, 1973 through June 30, 2022. Yes, June 30, 2022, Dr. Zelenko just passed away. He was an American family physician and author for promoting a three-drug combination of hydroxychloroquine, zinc sulfate, and azithromycin as a part of an experimental outpatient treatment for COVID-19 that he called the Zelenko Protocol. He also promoted unfounded medical advice, conspiracy theories, and misinformation about COVID-19 vaccination. On March 23, 2020, Zelenko published an open letter to U.S. President Donald Trump, where he claimed to have successfully treated hundreds of COVID-19 patients with a five-day course of his protocol. Zelenko's treatment protocol quickly gained notoriety with several media figures and various Trump administration officials promoting it, including Rudy Giuliani and then White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, despite cautionary messages from the health experts. If you couldn't tell, that was sarcasm in my voice as I was reading through that. So Dr. Zelenko passed away this week, succumbing to a four-year battle with cancer. He had a strong faith, albeit to the best of my knowledge, that faith did not include trusting in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of his sins. Nonetheless, he often described his cancer as a divine gift. Once he described it like this, my cancer is what prepared me for the COVID-19 pandemic. Without it, I would not have developed my passion for searching for answers that others said wouldn't be found. And without it, I could not have held to the persecution and ridicule that I received for daring to treat patients. I've looked death in the eye, and I have been made ready to meet God. I fear nothing on this earth. So brothers and sisters, that is what faith in actions looks like when we know the riches that await us on the other side of this life. And we understand the depths of evil on this side of, the, of eternity, which seek to distract us and confuse us from seeing clearly those riches that do await us on the other side. Do you see why it's important for us to really understand what heaven is and what it looks like? We want to focus on that. We want to have our minds set on those things. I think a lot of people are not excited about heaven because they really don't understand what heaven is going to be like. Maybe we just haven't taken the time to look at what the Bible tells us about our life after this one, or maybe we're deceived by foolish notions the world has fed us through the media influences like books, TV, movies, and elsewhere. I'd like to give you a real-world example of how this works. So, I knew a family. They emigrated here from Cuba. This was my first, my first job right out of college. Um, I don't know the full circumstances of their emigration to the U.S., but coming here was a miracle in their eyes. That I know for sure because I got to know them well. In fact, my wife Christine got to provide pediatric occupational therapy for their child that was born here in the United States uh, for a period of time while he was um, developing. Their older son was around 19 when I first met him. He started working at the place where his parents worked and where I happened to work. 
After having been here for a while and having found success in his new career here in the United States, he purchased what was at the time a very nice used car. It was a Dodge Stratus, a gold Dodge Stratus. I remember him telling me a story about communications he had with his friends uh, back in Cuba. He sent them pictures of his car and details of what his life here in the US was like. They told him he was a liar. And they dismissed his photos and the reports of what life was like here in the US as made up fiction. They just didn't believe him. You see, his friends, still in Cuba, had reliable information about what life outside of Cuba was like. If they would just give up the life they were living now and come to the US, they too could experience life like the reliable source that they had was testifying about but they refuse to believe. This is one of the reasons we shouldn't wait to give our lives to Christ. When we get accustomed to seeking after the things of the world and eventually, then we don't want anything to do with the things of heaven. We trade in eternal riches for the passions of fleeting things that rust and moths destroy, things that just do not last. So I think one of the reasons they rejected what he was telling them is because from their personal experience in history, they couldn't even imagine a place being as great as what he was telling them about. They just thought he was lying, trying to convince them of something that wasn't true. They instead convinced themselves that their friend was a liar and that his story was fantasy. It can't really exist, and it's just a fairy tale. Real life is only what they can touch, what they can see, what they can smell, and what they can experience, and all of that from inside of a communist island. The real world doesn't extend beyond what they know from their little world on the communist island of Cuba. I think this is how a lot of people on earth today see heaven. But we, as followers of Jesus, should not be ignorant of what the Bible says about heaven. We should be able to dispel the myths and speak intelligently about what God has revealed to us regarding what we so eagerly look forward to. We should be like someone who's in Cuba, hearing a message from a trustworthy person who has left that place and been to another place that has more to offer than we could ever imagine. Hearing his message about how wonderful America is and then spreading the news to all who will listen and believe and seek to go with us to a land flowing with milk and honey. Amen? All right, so um, that was what Mr. Zelenko said. Okay. So, what kind of a place do you think, do you think of when you think of heaven? What will we experience in heaven? What will it be like in heaven? What will you do in heaven? Who will be in heaven and what kind of relationships will you have with those other people? When do you get there and what happens in the time between when you die and the end of times finally comes? What about after the end of days? What about all the people who have already died? Where are they and what are they experiencing right now? Do you think the Bible has anything to say about all of these questions, or do you think God says, just trust me, it's going to be all good? I think the Bible has something to say about all these things. So one reason we might be confused about the subject is because we're trying to answer the wrong question. We ask, what is heaven like? When really, we should be asking, what is life after the first death like? They're different questions, kind of. So the first death, Hebrews 9, 27 to 28 says this, just as man is destined to die once, and I'm going to skip some of it, he will appear a second time to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So you guys have probably, um, uh, we're at the point where hopefully we're asking the right question. What's life after the first death like for those who die in Christ? So let's start looking at the question of where and when, when we die, um, I'm sorry, what do we mean by the first death? Most of us have never heard, uh, most of us have heard the saying, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. You guys have probably heard that. If not, you just did. Let me explain what that means. Born once, a physical birth. You physically die, then you experience the second death in what is referred to as the lake of fire, which comes after the great white throne of judgment. Born twice, a physical birth, and then a spiritual birth. By grace, through faith, when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, then you become exempt from the great, great white throne of judgment and the lake of fire. So, the second death. Revelation 2.11 says, 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says about the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. So this is the biblical proof for what I just said to you. He who overcomes, he who by faith, uh, by grace through faith, trusts in Jesus Christ, overcomes. We do not have to worry about the second death. Revelation 26, blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. Revelation 20:14. then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. I want to take a moment and, and make a point here. Notice, death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. What does that, what does that tell us? Hades and the lake of fire, they're not the same place. They're two different places. You can't throw something into itself. I think that's a common misconception that we have when we think about life after the first death. Hades and the lake of fire are not the same place. Revelation 21.8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, idolaters, and all liars will have their place. Their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur, the second death. So the second death literally is when someone is sent to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Trust me, you don't want to go there. And notice, the unbelieving are listed in with all of those other people. And truly, the unbelieving, that is the one that qualifies who is going to the lake of fire. Because all of those other things, we're all of those two, aren't we? Okay. Okay. So now we're at the point where we're asking the right question. What life after the first death looks like for those who die in Christ? Let's start with looking at the questions of where and when. When we die, where do we go, and when do we go there? So how many here today believe that when you die, you're going to the place where you will be for all eternity? Okay, so what you're saying is there are no layovers, no stops along the way, a direct flight from earth to heaven, and that's it. Your celestial travel is complete for all of eternity, right? After all, the Bible does say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and the Lord's in heaven. So that's it, right? Done deal. Don't need to talk about this anymore. Why did I even bring the question up? You might be surprised to find out that isn't exactly right. It's not exactly what happens. So to help illustrate this, I want us to look at an interpretation of a timeline of eschatology. And for those of you who don't know, eschatology is just a fancy word for the doctrine or theology of the end times. What does the Bible teach us about the end times when all of this will pass away? Not everyone is going to agree with what I'm going to tell you the Bible teaches about the end times. And I see Jamie squirming in his seat, smiling back there. So he's someone who might not agree with what I'm going to put up here. In fact, some here today might think some of this that I'm going to present has already happened in history. So for those of you who have studied the subject and think that the Bible teaches a different timeline, you're just going to have to bear with me and entertain this perspective for a little bit. Because I think that what we believe about eschatology is going to influence and, and direct the answer to those questions that we just asked. When and where are we going? So here it is. This is a a timeline of eschatology. Starting from the left, the cross represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Very simple. Notice the dotted line between the cross, the rapture, and the seven-year peace treaty. This is because I believe that between these events, the Bible does not reveal the specific amount of time that's going to pass. So in case anyone here is unfamiliar with the teaching of the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says the following, and let me see, does it come? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to get the clicker to do it. There it goes. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says the following. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, So we will be with the Lord forever. So the word translated here is caught up, um, which we also refer to as the rapture, comes from the Greek harpazo, and it literally means just to be snatched up. Now, I I want you to realize that the rapture is always described as an imminent event. 
That means it's not depending on anything else, and we don't know when it's going to happen. It could happen at any time, and you just don't know when it's going to happen. And that's demonstrated in this passage in Matthew. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be grinding in a hand, with a hand mill, one will be taken, and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have had his house broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Again, it's imminent. We don't know when. It could happen at any time. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52 says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. The, the word here, in a flash, in the original Greek, is atomos. That's where we get our, our word atom. A-T-A-M-O-S, atomos, is the Greek word that's used to, to say in a flash. What does that mean? This is going to happen so fast, it's an indivisible unit of time. It's not going to be like you see in the fanciful movies where all of a sudden the earth starts shaking and it's quaking and everybody's standing looking up and watching the sparkling lights go off into the sky. It's just going to happen in a flash. Do you see why I say media has influenced and probably misguided our perception of heaven, where we're going, how we get there, when we go there? Because people don't know their Bible. They don't study. But you do. So Revelation 7, 9 through 17 says this. Uh, hang on one second. I lost myself in my notes. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great white multitude that no one could count from every other nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. <clears throat> they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures, they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, They are those who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb of the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I believe that the main purpose for the Great Tribulation is for revival. It's so that those who go through that tribulation will turn back to God. That's why the tribulation happens. And I believe that that revival is going to happen in Israel, in the Jews. It's going to happen where they're going to finally acknowledge Jesus is the Messiah that they were waiting for, and they've had it wrong all this time. And I think that a passage that demonstrates this, and again, you can see on this timeline that that time period I'm talking about is right there near the middle, marked as the tribulation. It happens after that seven-year peace treaty. And another um, passage that shows this to us is, I think I passed it, I think it was Zechariah that I just went past. Yeah, Zechariah and Hosea, 
both of them, you can see at the end of Zechariah, they will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. So Israel is finally going to turn back and give themselves to Jesus. And in Hosea 5.15, we read, Then I will go back to my place until they admit their guilt, and they will seek my face. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. Israel, during this time of the tribulation, at least one-third of them who aren't struck down, are going to turn back to God. They're going to turn to Jesus. Okay. So, 2 Corinthians 5.8 says this. Um, well, where will, we, where will all of us be while this is happening? Here's the principle. Jesus is the bridegroom. We're his bride. Wherever he goes, we go. So if the question is, where are we going to be throughout any point on this timeline? The answer is, we're going to be where Jesus is. So if you want to know where you're going to be if you die today, where is Jesus right now? that's where you're going to be. You want to know where you're going to be during the tribulation? Where is Jesus? That's where you're going to be. You want to know where you're going to be during the millennium or after the great white throne of judgment? Just ask yourself the question, where is Jesus? That's where I'll be. It makes it very easy for you to understand where you're going to be and to know what to expect and to be excited about that because you're going to be a part of what we're looking at right here, what I call future history prophecy. So 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. If we're, out of, if we're away from our body, where are we? At home with the Lord. Wherever he is, that's where we are. 1 Thessalonians 4.16-17, through 17, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord, when? Forever. Wherever he is, that's where we're going to be. No question. It's not just for a period of time. It is forever. It lasts for all of eternity. So where is Jesus? Uh, let me make sure I didn't miss something. Right. So, where is Jesus during this period of time between the cross and the rapture? He's seated at the right hand of God. Colossians 3.1 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Psalm 110 verse 1 says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is why Jesus returns to earth at the end of the tribulation. That's when his enemies have been humbled and made a footstool for his feet. This means we remain with Jesus in heaven until the end of the tribulation, at which point we come back down to earth with him. Revelation 19, 11 through 14 says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire and his head and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a white robe, dripped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen and clean. We are the armies of heaven referenced in this passage. We are. We're, those, we're a part of those armies of heaven that are referred to in that passage. Jude, chapter 1, verse 14 through 15 says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. You, church, are his holy ones. You are made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and those holy ones are coming to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way, and all of the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against them. And again, in Zechariah 14.5, we see, You will flee by the mountain valley, for it will extend to Azal. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. Again, when the Lord comes, who comes with him? You do. 
all of his holy ones. So when he comes down for that millennial period, you're going to be down here with him. Revelation 26 speaks about the millennium. Blessed and holy are those who have a part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests and gods of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Again, you, you folks are the ones who are going to reign with him for a thousand years. Where? Right here on earth. So again, when I asked you if you have a one-way ticket to the place where you're going to be, and that's it, no more celestial travel for you, it's not entirely true. So if you focus on the end of the race and spiritual heavenly rewards, you're going to be motivated to live for the Lord all the days of your life that you have on this earth. You'll hold very loosely your treasures in this life and on earth, and you'll look forward to the treasures in the next life. You'll look forward to the experiences that you're going to have in the next life. I'll bet you that there are some young people who are sitting here today saying, I hope Jesus doesn't come back today. I just want to get married. I bet you there are some, some adults in the, in the group today who are saying, I hope Jesus doesn't come back today. I really want to start that business. I really want to see my grandkids. I really want, I really want, I really want. Because we're not looking forward to what's coming in heaven in, in our time with Jesus, which is going to be so much better than anything that you could have in this life. All right. So what will it be for us like in paradise and as, and as we wait for the millennium? Will we remember our family and friends? Will we have a physical body? Can people in heaven see what's happening on earth right now? I'm gonna, I hope to get through all these questions. I'm going to do my best to blast through them because I don't want to leave you guys hanging without knowing the answer to any of these questions. So now that we've looked at where, we, where and when, let's take a look at what it, at what it will be like when we leave this current life on earth. Here's the principle. What we experience in the next life will be tied to what we did in this one. I want to re repeat that because I think that's is probably the most important thing that you need to get out of this message today. What you experience in the next life is going to be tied to what you did while you were in this life. Again, here's the principle. We are saved by grace, but we are rewarded in the next life by our works. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you here with uh, this passage from 1 Corinthians that says, by, gr by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stone, wood, hay, or straw, his works will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be, a, it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved but only as one escaping through the flames. So hear me, I am not preaching salvation by works. You are not saved by what you do. You are not saved by your good works. You are saved for good works. The man who says, I believe in Jesus Christ, I receive him as my Lord and Savior, and goes on living the way that he did before he came to that place of professing faith in Jesus Christ, is a fool. Because everything that you're doing is going to get burned up in the fire. Who wants to spend eternity on the other side having everything they worked for burned up when you could have been storing up riches in heaven that will last forever? What, are the, what, what is the one thing that you can bring with you to heaven based on what you choose to do with your time in this life? Another soul. Another soul. That's the one thing you can bring with you. So when you want to know, Lord, what are you asking me to do? What do you want me to do in this life? You should be asking yourself the question, what can I do to influence other people for Jesus Christ? How can I live my life in such a way that people look at me and they see Jesus and they want to be with him? That is how you should be focused. That's what we should be looking for. Uh, so... 
Luke 16, 19 uh, through 31 says this, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this place. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered then, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So, this is a parable. A parable is used to illustrate a spiritual truth. So hear me when I say this. Parables are allegorical in nature. The people and places and events, they're symbolic. They're not real. It's not something that actually happened. The characters in this parable are symbolic, but their experiences are not symbolic. Their experiences are the whole reason that Jesus gave us this parable. He wants us to understand what is the afterlife like. He wasn't telling us a story about two men who lived on earth so that we could know about some, some rich man and this guy named Lazarus. He was telling us a story so that we could understand what is heaven like? What is life after the first death like? So let's make some observations about this passage. The rich man was fully conscious of his surroundings and those around him. We see that in verse 23. He remembered Lazarus, and he knew who Abraham was. <clears throat> so in heaven, you'll remember your family, your friends, your coworkers. You're not going to all of a sudden forget everything when you leave this earth. You're going to remember them. In Luke 17:4, Peter is apparently able to recognize Moses and Elijah when they appear before the transfigured Jesus. We'll be able to we will be recognizable in the next life with real physical bodies, material bodies. So question, if you find yourself in heaven and you see someone who you knew, maybe even a loved one, who is in the torment of hell, how do you think you're going to feel about that? How do you think you're going to feel about the way you chose to spend your time while you're here on this earth? Do you see why looking towards heaven is going to motivate you to live the life that you're supposed to live? We have to keep looking up. We have to understand the truths of eternity. So what we experience in the next life will in part be based on what we did in the life that we lived on earth. Look at um, uh, um, verse 25 and look at Luke 19, 11 through 27. On earth, the rich man exhort, uh, ignored Lazarus and left him to wallow and squander while he enjoyed, enjoyed a plentiful life. If you see your neighbor living in squander, you literally walk by that person and they long to eat the scraps that fall on your floor and you ignore that person. Does the Holy Spirit really live in you? So Jesus is not teaching salvation by works here. What he's demonstrating to us through this parable is what we do in this life is going to have an effect on what we experience in the next. So there is a chasm between those who have died apart from God and those who have died in a relationship with God, right? We see that in this parable. Jesus gave this parable before he died on the cross for our sins. Before Jesus died on the cross, where did people go when they died? 
Well, before he died on the cross, they didn't go to heaven. Why not? Because their sins hadn't been paid for yet. So they went to a place called the bosom of Abraham. The bosom of Abraham was apparently in the vicinity of Hades. And again, Hades is, is hell. It's not the lake of fire, right? We already um, established those are two different places. And, and Hades and, the, and Abraham's bosom, these were separated by a wide space that could not be traversed. You couldn't pass over from one to the other. It's done. You're either in Hades or you're over here. You're not getting from one to the other. So the teaching that we need to pay penance for someone who's died so that hopefully they can be transferred over to the other place, it's bunk. There's a chasm. You can't cross over it. If Abraham can't do it, I'm pretty sure none of us can. So after Jesus spent three days in Hades, he was raised up to heaven at the right hand of the Father, and all of those who were in Abraham's bosom went up there with him that day. So today, when we die, do we go to Abraham's bosom? Where do we go? We go where Jesus is. He brought all of the, those who have died before his resurrection up there to heaven with him, and that's where we're going to go. That's where we will be. If you die today before the rapture, you are going to go be up there with Jesus where he sits, and you're going to have a real physical body as you're up there in heaven. It's not your resurrection body, but it is going to be a physical body. Here's, here's another point. The rich man was fully aware of his family on earth. We see that in verses 27 through 28. So do you think you're not going to recognize your family when you get to heaven? So I said you're going to have a physical body. 1 Corinthians 12, 24 says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that a man is not permitted to tell. So, the word body is translated from the Greek word soma. This is the word used to describe a physical substance, the actual material of a tangible body. He was unable to tell if there was any difference between his body on earth and what he experienced during his short time in paradise. And a lot of biblical scholars believe that Paul was actually talking about himself here in this passage. Um, he was being humble and didn't want to say, I've had the privilege of going up to heaven, so he referred to himself in the third person. Apparently, this was a common use of, of language at that, at that point in time. We will not be disembodied spirits floating around in the ether. We're not going to be floating on the clouds, playing harps all day long, and you can come in and put your hand through me because there's nothing to me. You're going to have a real physical body. Can people in heaven see what's going on on earth? Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked for us. Hebrews 1, uh, so notice in this verse, let's make some observations. Not everyone is running in the exact same part of the race. There is a race marked out for us in verse 1. It's marked out individually. So, some of us here were made to be sprinters, some of us were made to be distance runners, and some of us were made for that really odd race, the 800 meter, where you pretty much sprint, but you do it for so long that when you're done, you think you're going to die. Regardless of which type of race was marked out for you, all of us are participating in a relay race. And it's our responsibility to receive the baton while then passing it on to the next runner to continue when we leave this earth but you need to be running your race nonetheless. So in the ancient world, athletic events were quite common, and often crowds would come out to watch the event. This was a common form of entertainment since Netflix hadn't been invented yet. While they didn't have smartphones or flat screens, there were theaters and coliseums with seating for large numbers of spectators. Think the Roman Colosseum. This is a picture 
of what Paul was painting for us. This is what the picture that Paul was trying to paint for us to see in, in this passage. He says, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Martus is the Greek word translated as witnesses. And this word can mean one of two things. It can either mean a person who testifies in a court of law, like we see in Acts uh, chapter 6, verse 13, which says they put forward a false witness, Martus, who said um, this man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. So that's a witness in a court of law. Or it could also mean a person watching an event, like we see in Acts 7.58. Uh, this is the account of the stoning of Stephen. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the, witness, the witnesses, Martus, laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. These were just observers. These were people who were watching what was happening while Stephen was being stoned. So this verse in Hebrews chapter 12, this fits the context of spectators, not those testifying of something, right? These are, these are, are beings who are watching what's happening. So this leads me to a conclusion that I believe our loved ones who have died in Christ are looking down on us right now, rooting for us, cheering when we run strong, and rooting for us when we need to get moving again. I believe that my wife's mother, who passed away when she was 13, is looking down on us and is rooting for us and is saying, go, run strong, finish, you can do it. They're watching. Because Paul uses the word cloud, it gives us the impression that the spectators are watching from above. So, again, I'm not saying that, it, that Scripture explicitly teaches this, what I am saying is I think it's implied. I think it's implied that the witnesses from above are watching us from heaven. Luke 9, 28, verse 31 says this. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up to a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of, of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in a glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. How did Moses and Elijah know what was happening on earth at that moment? How did they know about Jesus' impending departure? Based on what we read in these other passages, I think that the answer is pretty obvious. They were watching from above. Could it be that God is up there with a bullhorn saying, all right, everybody, here's what's going on on earth right now. Sure, that could be what's going on, but I don't think that that's what Scripture seems to be teaching us. So um, Luke... 15, 17 should be up on the screen right now, right? I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Again, how would heaven know when a sinner repents? Is God up there with his bullhorn? We just got another one in freedom, church. I don't think so. I think they're watching. I think that they see. So it looks like we're probably out of time. Um, and I think that probably gives you a very good picture of the timeline. What is it? When are you going to go where you're going to go? Where are you going? And what will you experience? And I want to leave you with this last thought. When God, I, I, we can look to Revelation, we can look to the end of the Bible to see what is our life after this one going to look like. But I think we can also look right back to the very beginning. We could look right to Genesis. Because when God created the earth, how did he create it? It was perfect. It was perfect. What did he want his creation to experience? He wanted his creation to experience what he had created before Adam sinned, right? That's what he wanted for us. Did you know that in Genesis, it says that God wanted Adam to work? He wanted him to work. So kids, I'm sorry, when you get to heaven, do you know what you're still going to do? You're going to work. But guess what? You are going to reap the benefit of your labor. No one is going to steal it from you. Do you know why? 
because no one's going to want to steal from you because God is going to make all things new. He's going to put in you a new spirit. And so all the work that you do, how many have you ever done a really good job building something, making something, singing a song, whatever you're good at, and you stand back and you look at your work and you admire what you did or you think about that time that you spent and you're like, I'm not trying to be prideful, but that was a really good job I did. And you just admire the work that you did. There is joy in work. And so again, you want to know what heaven is going to be like? Look at what the earth was like when God first made it before we messed it up. That's what it's going to be like.